All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. I'd like to welcome all of you to our virtual panel event titled Social Entrepreneurism. My name is Dan Shanahan. I am a professor at Damon College, as well as running the entrepreneurship program and artistic director of uh, Torn Space Theater. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us in this ongoing live virtual panel of events uh, that are really focused on discussing current uh, culture, current issues, and bringing in experts within their field to highlight um, all of the topics. So I want to put a thank you out to our sponsor, the Graduate Program at Damon College, for inspiring this event and these uh, wonderful conversations. So what I'd like to do before we get started is to go around with our panel and allow each of them to introduce themselves, giving them giving the audience a sense of their identity, roles, and titles. So I'd first like to welcome to our conversation, uh, Jawari. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jawaria Dahir. I serve as the executive director at E4ALL. Um, this stands for Entrepreneurship for All, and our core mission is essentially to work with entrepreneurs, helping them start, grow, and sustain their business. I haven't been in this role for too long. Um, many of you might know me in my former role. I was coming. I was in the public sector, worked um, under a under our mayor for six years, and my background is in architecture and planning. So a ton of neighborhood design projects, uh, but I've been in the in the realm of neighborhood design and economic development. So it's great to be here, and we're excited to um, have this conversation. Okay, wonderful. Welcome, uh, Cameron. I think you're uh, muted, Cameron. Classic Cam. Uh, sorry, everybody. My name is Cameron Garrity, and I am a graphic designer here at Damon College. Uh, I am here in the um, Institutional Advancement Division, so uh, help with marketing and communications. Uh, I also am. Um, the custodian of our school, uh, the puppet version of our school mascot, uh, Billy the Wildcat. And uh, from an extracurricular standpoint, I'm also the host of the Puppeteers podcast, uh, where we talk to uh, puppeteers and have conversations with um, people from all over uh, that industry. And I also freelance as a graphic designer. Wonderful. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, Jean Marie? Hi, my name is Jean Marie Kevens. I am the owner and head ideator of a production company called Little Shadow Productions. Um, we are focused on shedding light on important conversations, interesting people um, in and out of the world of entertainment, um, looking for places where we can uh, really get into it and make sure that our entertainment is, is useful um, and motivating. I'm also a writer, a producer, and a professional coach. Thanks for having me today. Well, thanks for joining us. And uh, Chad. Uh, my name is Chadwick Hobson. I'm the uh, co-owner and operator of the Knights Young Productions uh, based in LA. And um, I'm a filmmaker and writer and director and sometimes actor. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. So I wanted to uh, begin the conversation just by kind of framing it for our audience and uh, and giving some context to today's conver conversation. Um, so the heading of the, the talk is social entrepreneurship. So just so that we're kind of working off of a, a kind of a sort of a, a definition, I, I look to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that says this about social entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a process by which individuals, startups, and entrepreneurs developed and fund solutions that directly address social issues. A social entrepreneur, therefore, is a person who explores business opportunities that have a positive impact on the community. Uh, so we'll be looking at both social entrepreneurship through the lens of community activism, uh, local level community development, as well as the arts and culturals. Um, we'll wanna be exploring today really the impact that this uh, level of entrepreneurship has on the local community um, and how it's impacting the social landscape. I do want to uh, turn to one article that I think also provides some, some really interesting uh, context for today's conversation. Uh, David Brooks, um, political and cultural commentator, recently published an article in The Atlantic titled, America is Having a Moral Convulsion. Um, and he looks at uh, a historical perspective to find some type of parallel to a time similar to our own. Uh, and he zeroes in on the 1870s in the United States. And he identifies that time as an, an era where, where trust in, in many institutions were at a 
an all-time low. In large part, we have the Industrial Revolution creating mass displacement, economic divides, uh, and both corruption was both real and, and quite perceived by the public. So the reaction of, of the U.S. at this point of the 1870s, uh, David Brooks notes, was this, quote, people built organizations at a dazzling pace. Uh, organizations such as the United Way, the NAACP, the Boy Scouts, American Legion, the American Bar Association, and so many more um, were formed at this time uh, and in, in large part ushered in really the progressive movement uh, of the early 1900s here at the U.S., and so I think that this puts us in a really interesting point in the uh, 21st century in terms of how can the entrepreneur impact uh, both social change and as well as cultural change. And so I think that just gives a little uh, introduction to where we'll be putting the conversation today. So uh, kicking off our questions, I'm going to first turn to uh, Juari. Um, and the question I have here is, what do we think entrepreneurship means on the local level? If you could give us some um, kind of early definitions here and, and give us some parameters by which to talk by. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that um, brief overview, Dan. I think you've had, you know, you really hit the nail on that. So what I'll do is I'll give a little bit of perspective on our company, our organization, and then I'll try to answer that question in two folds. Um, so we are a national organization. So for the past 10 years, um, our company has just been on a mission to really help underrepresented individuals get the training, the technical support that they need to not only just start, but then also grow and sustain their business. And we do this through a, we have a free one-year business accelerator program. It's hands-on business training and obviously dedicated mentors. So there isn't this, the expectation of going through the program and just doing it on their own. And so as from a national statistics, we've been able to help well over 700 businesses launch and what's really interesting is 72% of those businesses are women owned. And then the other, no, there's also a 70% that's owned by people of color. And so these are businesses, you know, in 2020, they generated over 43 million in revenue. So that's just a really big picture. We're talking about over a thousand jobs. And so when we think about the question, you know, what does entrepreneurship mean at a local level? It means some of the things that you hit on, you know, it means what opportunities exist and for whom. And then it also means simultaneously what barriers are in place really preventing people from launching a business, growing a business, or even having that dream to start a business. And that's a huge undertaking. And so obviously this conversation and much of that is rooted in equity. So at e of course, me being the executive director and really leading this organization, our overarching mission is to really allow anyone, regardless of their background, their education, their zip code, we believe that they should be given the opportunity, the resources, support to then actually turn their dream of starting a business into reality. I'll give you a quick example. When you think about this um, on the ground level, think of um, think of a CEO, just really maybe the average wealthy middle class person, someone who's a CEO, is very well connected, et cetera. Their daughter approaches or maybe their son approaches and says, hey, you know, mom, dad, I'd like to start a business. Um, the first thing that you would do is, of course, you would because you're coming from a great socioeconomic background, you would connect them. You connect them to a banker. You create. You connect them to a creative artist, um, probably a website designer. You get them um, a lawyer to form an LLC, um, an insurance broker. All of that. On the other hand, the reality for most people, um, the average person, the people that we work with at E4L, they do not have these resources. So no one's ever forced them to really think about you know, get them to or really get them to do any sort of um, back on envelope calculations. And so that's kind of the step by step process that we think about when it comes to this question of what does entrepreneurship mean at the local level. And then one last thing I'll just conclude with is when we invest in mainstream businesses, um, in people who are, you know, your neighbors, um, we're talking about your parents, um, I guess the parents of your soccer friends, and that's really what adds vitality to our neighbors, especially the communities that are mostly underserved. And quite frankly, there aren't many resources like that, whether it be here in Buffalo, in Western New York, or really across the country. Hence, we have a national organization. And in my role, especially coming from the public sector, um, A, as a person of color, in my experiences, obviously, as an expert also, for the past six years, we're all we're really helping and focusing to create robust businesses in Buffalo. And in Western New York, you know, we've got active tech incubators, which are awesome. There's also other groups that offer technical assistance to startups. Um, and there's also usually a cost associated. Again, the average person can't afford that. And most of them aren't really designed to help the entrepreneur start or grow or sustain their business while also being handheld by three mentors. 
So really, in a nutshell, we're accelerating economic and social impact. And we're doing this nationwide through inclusive entrepreneurship. And then you really hit the nail with what the inclusivity means. And this focus is really on non-traditional folks, those that, those that have been told, you know, entrepreneurship is not for you or face systemic and economic and additional social barriers. I hope that answers the question. Well, not only does it answer the question, but I think it, it starts to push us into some, some interesting territory that we'll be looping back throughout today in terms of both equity and inclusivity, but also this point you brought up, which is sort of creating it, well, not sort of, actually creating an infrastructure to where emerging entrepreneurs can succeed. Um, especially entrepreneurs who don't have maybe those built-in networks that you're going to get, as you say, from a, a, a traditional sort of middle-class upbringing where, you, where, the, where the parents of the entrepreneur can help connect the dots. And I think we, we see this quite um, starkly in the, in the creative economy. Uh, so I'm going to kind of use this as a, a launching pad to move to uh, Jean, Jean, uh, Jean-Marie. Um, where, again, we, we, we start to see a lot of established artists, um, let's say, you know, paint a picture here, they're able to get a, a studio, whether it be in, in New York or Brooklyn, um, just getting themselves started out. We could assume possibly that their parents are helping them. The parents are helping them make some early connections in terms of a, a purchasing of their work or, or a liaison to get into a gallery. Um, if you don't have those types of networks, of course, you're at a, quite a disadvantage. So the, the question I have, uh, Jean Marie, here is um, if we're looking specifically at the, at the artist, um, how could they best act as entrepreneurs, both in a traditional or possibly unexpected way, in order for them to either accelerate their career or establish their career? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. I, it's interesting to hear you uh, line it up talking about parental support or network support, because I know very few artists um, who have that luxury. So, um, you know, these are people who not only don't have that support, but don't even have a foundation to know where to get it. And... Um, you know, I think the biggest uh, attribute that an artist brings to the entrepreneurial uh, conversation is that their their job is to innovate. Their job is to ask questions. Their job is to shine light on things. That is what they do inherently. So I think most artists, um, if they don't have the information, have the ability to, to ask questions um, and find community. The challenge is that there needs to be that key person in the community who is the connector. Um, I definitely am aware that that is one of my roles in, in my community. Um, not, a, not a role I asked for, but a role that I saw the necessity and said, okay, I understand, right? But the reason that I am a successful, whatever that means um, to me, entrepreneur is that I read Black Enterprise Magazine. I read Wired. I read outside of my own circle. So that when I am reaching out, when I'm asking questions, I am asking questions with a baseline of knowledge and knowing that all I'm coming to this with is a baseline of knowledge and a passion. Because as an artist, I am passionate about the topics that I want to talk about. So um, I think in the community, once you find those connectors, one hopes that artists can then continue to bring people in. The only challenge is ever, from my experience, those isolated artists who prefer to be isolated, prefer to, they want to be found, they want to be hungry, they want to hurt. That's a personality trait, right? Like, I don't think that that is endemic of the world of the arts as a whole, which is a massive, massive world, right? We've always had arts and culture. So as long as you're telling a good story, somebody's going to find you and support you. But the number one key to succeeding, meaning you can sustain yourself and eat off of your art, is asking questions on where you can find support. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So, you, the, so you, so you see your role um, as a connector essentially as connecting an, an artist to um, resources or to individuals that can give them greater skill sets. Could you just just quickly let us know kind of what you think the the role of this connector is? Sure. So I'll give you an example from my own. Um, doing, which is, I think, the only one I can really speak for. So I am involved in different organizations and have gotten educated at different arts organizations that teach you how to budget, how to communicate, how to connect, um, and how to connect, meaning how do I reach out to a theater and say, hey, I've got a show that's unlike anything else you have, but would also serve this, this audience that you already have established, right? Let's introduce them to something new. Why am I 
why am I unique? Why am I essential? So I've learned that language. I've learned the language of, okay, what is your budget? What does that look like? I can back into that and this is how. Additionally, my company, Little Shadow, set up an academy to answer questions when they come up. So a lot of artists don't know how to do the budget and they don't know where to find the organization, but they know that I have the skills. So I will bring in people to come in and teach marketing, um, analytics, whatever it is that they need. And my, my um, mandate is basically at the top of any Little Shadow Academy workshop is ask us what you need. The answer is yes. We just have to find out how and when. And I think that that is the spirit of an artist, right? The answer is yes, just how and when. So I think by modeling that, we're able to help an artist grow. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, I do wanna now, uh, I'll turn to Chadwick, um, who provides us with a, a, a unique perspective. Um, here we have an artist who's been able to successfully navigate a large Hollywood system, but also move into kind of independent, more personal <laughs> projects. And, and that sort of um, is what's driving this question. And Chadwick, I, I do have an assumption kind of built into my question. So if I'm off on this, please um, correct me. Um, what I'm, what I'm interested here is what does it take for an artist as entrepreneur to both launch, build and grow a successful company or vision that in large part is dominated by the studio system or the Hollywood system that seems to suck up so much resource and energies. How, how does one kind of push forward on whether, you know, push forward on their unique vision, whether it be starting a independent film, independent production studio, um, really benefit, I think, from, from hearing your insight on that. Yeah, um, thank you, and wonderful responses so far. Uh, I, I think that um, for me, when I first started out there and I was kind of going, uh, uh, you learn something very, very quickly, and that is uh, in an industry of that size, like they don't, you're not really allowed to do anything if you haven't already done it before which is like the, the basic rule in the catch 22 of like, you want to sell a television show or even be on a television show or write something to make it. No one wants to invest in you unless you can prove that you've done it before. Um, and so in turn, like when you're looking at the, the system as a whole, uh, there are so many things involved in, in that, that are extremely daunting that make you not want to participate. Um, but the number one rule that, that kind of, shines through is is very simple and it's if you can if they can't find you anywhere else then you'll never stop working um and i think that like uh, in doing so like when you're looking at that that system there are so many examples and that's of people that have started where you have and how did they get there and there's every different path and i think that like no matter how big hollywood is there's like a I mean, the Duplass brothers is, is a perfect example of, of showing how to navigate the system when it's not given to you. Um, and that is like they made a 20 minute short film that got into Sundance about uh, of him re-recording a message machine um, for his phone. Like then that, that launched his entire career um, because it was just a unique story in 20 minutes that was shot on a camcorder. It didn't even sound good. But the, the most important thing, which applies to I think all of business, um, especially in Hollywood, is the if you look at how to fit into the system, you will fail. Um, if you want to be an artist and, and a voice in that sense, but if you look to see how you can improve the system or how your voice is unique and you could provide something new that they don't already have, then you would be uh and then you'll you'll never stop working like it's it's a there's so many complexities to the system of hollywood and each project that i've ever done and made and how it progressed has always been um you know like that i could talk about that for hours but very simply put like i i talk about gall's law a lot whenever i do this for a lot of people and that is like no complex system works it's all based off of a simple idea and no matter how big the 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 industry is or how dominating it is the the simple thing is if you can come up with an idea that's that's so simple but yet works and is new and it's provided with like parts of you that don't exist out in the world whether it be a business whether it be a local business or or you know in this industry wherever it is if you can kind of find your unique point of view and the passion behind whatever idea that you have um it's almost like you 
they have nowhere else to get you. So you'll never, you'll never stop working. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to uh, Cameron on this question. And then I'm going to have what I call kind of a round robin um, where I'll, I'll ask a sort of a breakout question to each of our, of our panelists uh, for sort of quick responses. Um, so, so Cameron, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm interested, uh, I think that you'll be able to add a, a nice kind of perspective here is that you have a, a, you know, a good sense of kind of understanding um, the, the personality of, of the business. Um, and in you, you talk about kind of how, you know, the personal vision of a business can be articulated, whether it be through marketing or, or other means um, so that it can get its vision out there. Could you speak a little bit about, about that? Absolutely. Um, I think there's something really valuable in knowing uh, what the voice or a character of an institution can be. Um, I've been really fortunate in my time uh, as a graphic designer and as someone who who works in marketing to really um, be uh, up close and personal with the the clients that I'm working with and to really be able to define uh, what what makes this work, what makes it unique, uh, and how to 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 translate that so other people can can get excited about that. Um, similar to what what Chad was saying about you know showing people your 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 place in an industry and being able to l lead you to to what makes you unique and special and and to earn earn that place. Um, and so, you know, it, it, for instance, with my time at Damon, um, I have the benefit of having been a student here, of having uh, worked here as an artist in residence and as a, uh, a an adjunct faculty member. And now I'm in this really sweet spot of being able to uh, help, you know, move our, our marketing and our, our commercials and, and everything that we do to get the word out about Damon and really infuse it with that perspective of, of what makes a place exciting and, and memorable. And I've, I've been able to do that when I've worked with uh, other uh, institutions as well as, um, you know, certainly in the world of, of puppetry, um, you know, everything from being able to help promote people when they come on, on puppeteers, um, as well as, uh, you know, when we, when we do work um, to, to help, you know, people market their shows, um, really being able to say, um, you know, how, how can we do this and how can we get that voice across in a, in a really unique way? Great. Wonderful. So, um, you know, kind of pulling from all of the, uh, it, the themes that are being brought up by the panelists, this kind of leads me to um, just sort of what I call, you know, this kind of quick round robin before we take a, a brief break. Um, certainly themes of um, equity, inclusion, figuring out ways to articulate personal vision, uh, as well as creating an, an infrastructure to kind of support um, that vision has been a lot of the ideas being discussed um, so far in this conversation. And kind of going back to the, my, my introduction comment, um, this a lot of times is delivered through the, you know, the organizational structure. That, that's what allows it to become sustainable and be able to be impactful in the world. So what I would um, like to ask each of the panelists, starting, uh, I think going back to starting with Joari first, is, you know, what is what is your take on how to create a sustainable organization that's that's able to push forth the unique vision that you have? Um, what are the, what are some of the um, sort of tools that you think are are most uh, crucial to make that happen, uh, Jawari? Thank you for that question. I think we may have lost Jawari just for one moment. I'll, if I could move over to Chadwick on that question. Yeah, you actually broke up a little bit on my end too. Can you say that one more time? I was breaking up. You're saying I'm sorry. No, I. Uh, uh, the end of it. Yeah. So, um, how what how do we kind of support an infra an organizational infrastructure to really get our unique vision out in the world? Well, I would like to defer to Juaria on that. She's back. Juaria, you're back. Did did I break up on you, Juaria? Did you hear the the last part of my question? I apologize. You broke up on me. Um, I'm breaking up on everyone. Dad, why don't um, you Why don't no, you go no. first, and then I'll I'll follow up after you. Okay, let me let me repeat it, and then we'll we'll stay with you, Joari, on this one. Um, if we're looking at um, the organization as the way in which the individual can put out his or her vision on the world, 
Um, what are some of the practices or tools that we really need to consider in order to create a sustainable organization that is allowing for, for an inclusive environment or to promote equity or to facilitate creativity? I think it just starts with leadership. It just starts with ensuring that everybody at the table making a decision is reflective of the people in the community. Um, if folks can see themselves um, on a billboard, if they can see themselves in the boardroom, they will, you know, they will always aspire and understand what that barrier or opportunity would look like. It's one thing, for instance, to say today, I'm going to serve the homeless population, for instance. But if you've never had um, a close friend or maybe even a relative or somebody that you've worked with at a, at a different capacity and not just from a service oriented perspective, you'll have a different empathetic and understanding and a relationship. So you'll be serving them, but you're also going to understand the overall challenges that they might be facing. Maybe it be the economic side, the transportation side, and you're not just going to look at homelessness as one isolated um, in, in, um, basically challenge. And so for the most part, again, it's a, a ref making sure that the folks in the room are reflective of the issue, of the service, of the work, um, and prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just as a billboard, but more of a, embedding that as part of their implementation processes in all of their works. Fantastic. And then, so building on that, then if I, I turn to you, Chadwick, um, again, about this kind of organizational structure that allows a personal vision. Um, I'm, you know, I'm sure you know all too well that seemingly many Hollywood plots, films, they do have a, a formula, they're tried and true, they're tested. They have an economic model that works, just like McDonald's has an economic model that works. But when you try to go against that system or try to kind of shift it in any way, um, you know, there's, there's challenges to, to, be, to be had. Um, so could you just give a little insight into how you've been able to get your um, personal vision across as a storyteller, as, a, as, a, as an artist? Yeah, well, it, it first started by by kind of finding a way to take the power away from them, um, the ability to not have a voice, and and I think that's something that is is taught and in like a stereotypical kind of uh, ideology behind Hollywood is is it's hard to break into the industry, but the fact of the matter is like there are actors and there are storytellers and playwrights in all aspects of the world that put on plays that are like a 20 person play in a small box theater somewhere to me has like far more impact than, uh, you know, a bunch of people watching a, a sitcom about a talking dog. Like, and, and, and so like when you look at that and the, the system as a whole is set up to keep against you is like, how do I, how do I find a way to tell a story without the system? Um, and, and in a way, like that's kind of how I got in. So when you talk about the, the structure of it, I learned how to um, exist in the world of art without the um, ability to ask permission to tell the story. And the moment that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do, especially when you don't have that background, but like uh, I learned how to do it and I learned how to tell stories for no money. Um, and then when the more stories that I was able to tell, the better my voice got, the more specific, but also at the same time while I was learning how to do this, I was also creating work and equity. Uh, my first feature film I made for $800. That was our production budget. Um, and we, we, we wrote it the week before we had an editor and we, we shot it and it was just film school for me. Like it was 20 pages a day and learning how a film set operates, how editing works, how everything that uh, involved in making uh, something a visual medium and then all the way to the finished product, which was such a struggle to do it. But while I was doing that, I was learning, creating a blueprint for how I can tell any story that I want as long as I learn how to write for it at its inception. But also I was creating equity. Like that, that project itself was like the the one question that's asked a ton of people is like whenever you want to do anything in the industry have you made a feature before and i can say yes they never watch it but even so like we got iced tea to narrate it because we just randomly asked him and it was great and now it's like this movie on amazon prime that was literally built to just be practice and i think that a lot of the times when you look at i mean this industry and the way it's set up and maybe you know a ton of other industries it's it's very uh, comparable but it's it's finding something like 
learning how to do something, learning how to find your voice or finding like your passion and pointing it in a more specific direction, all the while showing people that you're doing the same thing and others will follow and take you more seriously. I mean, that, that was my uh, experience. Great. And I'm sure, uh, Jimmy, this is really speaking, I think, a lot to, to your idea of, of connecting and, and getting people kind of entering into the system, whatever that, you know, artistic system might be. So could you uh, also build on that? Yeah, it's interesting to me because I had the same experience in Hollywood, right, where every job I took, I was asked, have you done this before? And yes, because you have to create your own content to be seen. And that's the same thing in theater. That's been the same experience in visual arts. Um, so, you know, my takeaway from what everybody has just said is, is very much my own experience of social proof, right? People want to know that you can do it, but they also want to know that you're doing it with authority. And for me, you know, uh, when you were asking the question about diversity and inclusion, that's baked into the DNA of my company. There's no question, right? It's in the initial statement. This is what we do. This is who we are. This is who's invited to the table. If the chair isn't at the table, we will teach you to make your own damn table, right? We are here to uh, have important conversations and we will learn how to do that. So if I am not the voice that needs to be heard, I will find that person, I will hand them the megaphone and we will create the story around that tale that is so important that it be told. So, you know, that common thread of storytelling and that common thread of passion and that common thread of, um, of daringness you know, I wouldn't call it fearlessness because you're full of fear, but um, you're bold enough and have enough gumption to say, I will be seen, I will be heard, and I will find the community and build that around me so that I can grow and sustain myself. And as you do that, you find the next level of community. You know, some of them come, some of them go, and, and that's okay, you know, but I, I think that that's a common thread through all of our industries and um, entrepreneurship as a whole. Yeah, I, I, I agree fullheartedly. And I think there's something talking about like the, uh, the both both of you guys were touching on of like inclusivity um, in and kind of starting leadership. And I think the the uh, most important thing, I think, in, in order for me and my experience to promote um, other people to to follow their passions, whatever it may be, is being able to operate in a leadership role, but also doing it with like ease and kindness. Because it is, it's like terrifying. It, it, there's so much fear that you have to push through and you don't do it perfectly. And like in the culture that we set up, like competitiveness is the number one thing that we're taught at such an early age. Um, and and for me, the, the best experience that I've had with people and helping them kind of uh, show them like you can do this too. This is not, I'm not creating ground breaking work here. I'm just showing you that you can do it. But all the while in a competitive industry like that, doing it with like, you don't pay attention to the, the, the things that are set up about who you're supposed to be when you're this successful, like you, you're supposed to kind of fit into a personality trait when you're a leader in some way. And I think that like the best way to promote inclusivity and also other people do so is to include people that obviously like come from different backgrounds, but do so and create with kindness, like most importantly, uh, tolerance and kindness and passion um, as, in the leadership role is so important, especially like kindness. I cannot say that enough, um, especially yet in, in the industry that we that we work in. Jawari, you wanted to uh, jump in on a comment? Yes, um, just really quick. I mean, just summarizing what everybody's already said. Um, this is not just unique to the Hollywood industry. This is pretty much in every space, whether it be uh, in the academia, in the workforce, etc. When it comes to confidence, at least the way that I look at it is confidence in your own skin is really what you make of it rather than how your skin actually looks. Um, I mean, physically, the way that you might dress, the way that you might appear, people will always have their biases and their perspectives, their perception of who you are, what you could do and what you should do. And so at the end of the day, uh, the best thing that you can do for your confidence is just to just really focus on that, build yourself, and then find yourself a mentor. I think if you've got the right mentor, you'll be able to then push yourself to that next level and don't take no as an answer. I don't think any of us have. Excellent. So what we're going to do is thank you so much. We're at a, at the halfway point. I think the conversation is really rolling now. Um, the concepts and themes are, are coming into focus. So if anyone in the audience has questions, they, they're also welcome, please, to uh, submit those questions in the chat box, and I'll be happy to pass those on to the moderators. Um, so we're just going to take a brief break uh, to allow for a message from Damon College's graduate studies, and then we'll be right back. Thank you so much. 
Damon College, we strive to help every student reach their educational and professional goals. With exceptional resources and one-of-a-kind learning experiences, our graduate and professional programs will put you on the right path to career success. Our graduate programs include applied behavior analysis, education, nursing, social work, and more. Seven of our 11 graduate programs are open to any undergraduate major. Explore our graduate programs today by visiting damon.edu slash graduate. All right, and we are back. Um, so I want to, um, as we're talking about social entrepreneurship, um, it's all against the, the, uh, the backdrop of um, the for-profit industry uh, that drives so much of um, sort of free market in which we're existing within. So I'm going to um, turn to Jawari here to, to get us started on this um, part of the conversation. So if we essentially take, you know, the for-profit model as having the primary objective of maximizing profit, um, we, we recognize though, though there, there will therefore be sort of gaps, unmet needs in the society that don't align with profit which I guess is, you know, the reason why social entrepreneurism comes to it in, into existence in our, in our communities. So uh, knowing that there are gaps in the, com the communities that we live within that are not being addressed by sort of a for-profit model, can you speak about either where you think the, the biggest gaps are or how, how can communities best sustain um, organizations that fill these gaps even though it doesn't necessarily work within a, pro a for-profit model. I can jump in a little bit. I, I think that, oh no, Juar, you go. Okay, um, I guess just from a very high level perspective, you know, when you think about when COVID initially hits, right? There's definitely no doubt that obviously the pandemic itself added um, to small businesses challenges, not just around the world, but on our own backyard. So regardless of their size, their location, our funding, there was um, there was a huge barrier. Um, we don't have to go into the detail of that because we already know what happened. But what we've learned at least is that communities always need small businesses. Um, and we need small businesses to start or else what, what you're going to do is you're going to lose employment. And there was a really good study, um, I believe it was from the Kaufman Foundation. And what they quoted was that, you know, if communities are not starting a business, if communities are not launching new businesses, um, the employment drops in cities that are obviously not supporting new businesses. And we, we see this in a lot of our communities that are really tied to one big employer, for instance. And what that does is it creates a vacuum and you have a bunch of new people that don't have jobs and all properties on Main Streets are vacant. And if you're not filling up Main Street retail space, you obviously lose employment over time. Um, so from our perspective at IFRL, our focus obviously is on underrepresented entrepreneurs in communities. And this is primarily because they are a source of untapped potential. And um, when we think about untapped potential, you can, always, you can also think about, you know, formerly incarcerated folks. There are so many non-traditional folks that are all untapped potentials. Even when you think about, um, and I hate this term, but the new Americans are really just any type of immigrants or refugees that have come into this country, for instance. Um, there's that assumption that maybe they're not a skilled labor force. There could be, maybe they were farmers in their home, in their native country. So just because they don't speak the English language um, does not mean that, you know, they should by default just become a janitor or and not to say that really being a janitor is a bad thing or not. But my point really here being is understanding what those gaps are can sometimes mean not looking at the obvious barriers such as language, you know, transport, mode of transportation, um, even disability. Obviously with COVID, a lot of our jobs, we were able to now shift from working working from home. For many years, we, many of us have been told this, especially in the professional sense, oh, it's impossible to work from home. So now being able to adapt um, I wonder how many folks that have a disability who could have just comfortably worked from home over the years have been told no. Um, I hope that answers your question. And so you see a shift in kind of maximizing profit to maximizing potential uh, as a way in which you can facilitate greater growth. And I know, Ch uh, Chad, you wanted to um, follow up on a point here. Yeah, I was talking. I mean, I, I'm I'm not in. I mean, I, I think it's, I can speak on the specific, uh, specificities of, of my industry and how you talk about like the model of making money doesn't fit. And um, I think that there is there is which is great. It, it's it's almost like the the profit model of of this industry is created by the creators. Like and and then you see like Marvel movies took off like crazy, but right now because of the shift of like these these streamers are are studios now. But what they're doing, also what we're seeing, is a lot of 
movies about um, people that we haven't seen movies from typically that have a small budget and massive profit margins to the point where now like there is no argument to the point like for anyone that says like this won't make any money even though it's a good story is like well i have 40 projects like i can point out right now for sub one million dollar budgets that have grossed 25 times that so the model is kind of the profit what makes profit in this industry is kind of up to us in order to create and kind of pierce the zeitgeist and define like the kind of people we want, the kind of stories we want to tell and want to be. And the audience now, um, as we're seeing, is starting to react that way to push kind of the profit model in this industry in a different direction than it's ever been before, which is more inclusive. So it's, it's great that we've actually, as creators and as audience members watching, like as viewers, we have shifted the profit model um, in this industry to be completely different and improve to give voices and to new storytellers, you know? So I think, it, I think there's, there's ways to fit into a system where you have to like choose where you want to venture out in order to, I don't know, use your voice, but still be able to pay rent at the end of the day. But now we're starting to see the ability to shift that model to be like only what you want to do. And that makes money. And I know, uh, Cam, you've, you've also created an you know, organizational structure and an outlet to facilitate your own creative interest in, in the puppetry industry. Um, so could you speak to some of the points that have been uh, recently brought up? Uh, the, the, uh, just uh, unmute. Yeah. Thank you, Cameron. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, yeah, no, for, I, I'd love to speak quickly just to um, to graphic design and, and advertising. I think as we've seen a lot of the um, the ways that the tides have changed and the way that um, different social movements have, have come up, we see companies responding in ways to address things like Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement. And um, it, it really does come from from the consumers willing to to support those things financially. And uh, it, it may sometimes seem like the tail is wagging the dog, but it, it really are it is these these great opportunities for for the, the consumers to tell tell these big businesses how how they want them to to respond to the things that are that are happening in our world, and um, you know from from a from a puppetry standpoint, and trying to create work um, and and displaying work that um, that is also responding to these to these issues. I think it's really important for. Um, for the people who are are funding things and for for giving artists these these spaces to to explore to really being open to um, what what the stories are that are wanting to be told and and also for the artists in in the promoting of of their work and making sure that um, they are are making space for themselves um, and and finding the audiences that they want to be able to to present to, I'll, I'll add one more thing and then I, I know we'll, we'll want to move on, but um, I love, um, I refer to as, refer to it as the broad city model um, because when Abby and Alana were first creating their show, which of course went on to be this huge smash hit for, for Comedy Central, it was a series on YouTube. And what I love about the way they would do things is that they would write a script, for instance, uh, around someone going to a dentist. And they were working as people who were doing um, search engine optimization strategy. And so they knew to put special tags and keywords into the videos that they were creating. So, um, you know, hopefully a video would go viral in general, but if they could get it viral within these certain niche industries. So, uh, you know, if it, if a video could be circulating around the dentist message boards, um, you know, then, then it's a great way to, to find a whole new swath of audiences. And I think being able to, to pinpoint your marketing and things, even if your, your work has nothing to do uh, with with dentists, maybe your uh, you know a character has that, and you're able to to speak to a truth um, in in any one of those side industries, and and that's a way to generate um, you know new audiences so that they're they're there and ready to see when you have this this really new wonderful work that you want eyes on. Mm 
Great. Thank you so much, Cam. I'm going to uh, turn to uh, Jean Marie on uh, kind of added a new kind of additional sort of concept or topic into today's conversation, uh, which is competitive competitiveness. Um, I'm sure within your industry, um, even as you're connecting individuals, we see quite a, a it still has to be a, a competitive landscape. Um, not necessarily that's a zero sum game, but um, competitiveness does kind of drive innovation and, and does um, kind of set the parameters in, in large part. So on, on the kind of the ground level that you're seeing, uh, Jean Marie, could you speak a little bit about how you see competitiveness either driving entrepreneurism or how it can help facilitate greater entrepreneurism in the arts? Yeah, it's interesting um, to hear it phrased that way because to me, the competitive nature isn't always really what's going to serve us best. It's the um, eagerness, the passion, the drive to be part of a larger conversation that's really going to bring us there. And while competitiveness exists, I think we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot a bit when we're looking at other people's work. To Chadwick's um, point earlier, you know, I'm not going to be a Duplass brother. I'm a woman, right? I'm always going to be a woman. And that I, I love that about me, right? So I'm going to bring my feminine part of the conversation to the table and I'm going to lead with that. And if that makes me competitive in someone else's eyes, that's unfortunate to me. To me, I'm just passionate and I'm driven and I want everyone to win. I want that. I want us all to, to raise the bar. So if competitiveness means raising the bar, I'm in. But if it means taking someone else down to get somewhere, I'm out. You know, that's not part of my conversation. For me, it's like, let's let's get as much water underneath us so everybody's boat rises. Um, and that makes things more interesting. And, and to, to Cam's point about um, advertising, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the same principle goes for the arts. You know, if you were trying to do a play about Black Lives Matters 10 years ago, when it was frankly even bigger needed, right? It was it was essential at that moment to be having that conversation. It wouldn't have got made, right? We had to have more turmoil. We had to have more pain, more strife. Now it's going to get made, but who's going to go? The same people who are marching in the streets, right? Who's going to buy a Coca-Cola because there's an ad campaign attached? Me. And I don't even drink soda, right? I'm going to do it because I want to support them for, for getting behind the thing that I'm most passionate about. So to me, the, the competition is less important than, than the ethos of why I'm doing something, what, what really matters. And I think that most artists, including commercial artists, have a, have a point of view that they want to be heard. And if that makes them competitive, fine. But um, it needs to come from a place of kindness, positivity, and, and eagerness. And eagerness should not take food from the mouths of others. That's just my soapbox, but I feel really passionate about it. And I think right now in the arts world, you will get knocked down for not looking at the social good. And then um, I think it's important to, let's bring in Chadwick here on this on this point, because we'll look at yeah, I mean, outside it's, of the coast, we'll look at the, you know, we're, we're your perspective from both through Hollywood and, and what you're seeing on the, on the West Coast, if you want to speak yeah. to that point. Monetarily, like it, it's so, when you talk about, um, I think that's, that's uh, so well put. Um, but even, even especially the competitiveness in this industry, like my therapist said something years ago that stuck with me forever. And it was just like the, the industry is, is the crab bucket analogy. I don't know if you guys have heard that, but it's just like, there's no lid on a crab bucket because like the moment one of them almost makes it out, the other ones grab it and pull it back down. And that through and through is, is this industry. And when you look at like, I, I luckily call it a great education, wonderful friends and a good family. Um, I learned, you know, lead with kindness and, and be a cheerleader, like other people succeeding around you. It's really hard sometimes to look and be like, what's wrong with me? Like, why am I not doing this? But when you break that down and you kind of go like, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with me. This person just found a voice or a moment or hit it and it's wonderful and whatever it is. And to learn how to break through that and support them and like genuinely like be so excited for the people around you when they have success, just that and supporting them and going to shows or whatever it may be, it's great. And I can actually tie a majority of the biggest successes in my career to years later, people that I was just supportive to and just loved how good they were doing. 
they rewarded me later because they were like, I want to work with that guy. I really loved that guy and he made me feel great and he helped me with this without asking for anything in return. I'd like to do that. And it's, it's, it's helped my career a ton unintentionally. But I think that there is like, there is work to do in order to, to understand an awareness of when you're doing that and when you're looking around, whether it be jealousy or whatever it is, working through that and breaking it down and being a supportive individual that is just people's cheerleaders when, when people are succeeding around you and you're not. It's hard to do. It's very. It's harder to. You, you know, it's harder to do than I, than what it says. But once you learn how to do that, I think it's just pure gold. After that, it can only help you, and also make you a better person. Thank you. Yeah, and Chad, I, uh, I'm I'm sorry, Dad. No, please jump in. Uh, I I'm I'm just always amazed. Uh, one of the things we hear over and over again when we're interviewing puppeteers on the on the podcast is how many people say that they don't need to audition for jobs or they don't need to show a, a portfolio to get work because um, they just, they demonstrated their value and they were a kind and easy person to work with um, mm -hmm. either on set or in a workshop. And um, that, that is such an important thing of just like, who, who do you want your coworker to be? Who would you want to bring onto the job? Or do you want to, you know, if there are two artists who are both wonderful uh, with the work that they create, but one's a pain in the ass and one is like a salt of the earth kind of Mr. Rogers type, you're going to go with them. Um, and so, and, and that's across the board. Um, but it's, it's just a, a really intriguing pattern that, that, that like I said, I, I see all the time in talking with these professionals. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Jawara and enjoy that you'll have an opportunity to comment on um, the point that was just made. But I also want to bring this question into our conversation, kind of reinforcing the, the notion of social entrepreneurship um, and, and, and how it engages with the, with the local level. Um, can, can you speak a little bit about, you know, whether there's a, is there a, sh sort of a, a shift in the, in the cultural landscape to where on the local level, people are becoming more responsive to social entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, do you think it's, are we in, or is it more of a cynical climate where, where we're not being responsive to it? Um, where, where are we here uh, in terms of the organizational structure or social entrepreneurship really not only solving problems on the local level, but also creating the identity of of a locale so you know buffalo becomes distinct from detroit etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and how does the sort of where are we on that yeah um that's a really really good question i'm just going to quickly comment on what cameron and chad were just speaking on um i think just being very well versatile and being a good connector is so so important but um, many times, even as young people, when they come into a specific career, sometimes it's the person is offered a job because you're liked. And I think if that's the reason why you're offered a job, unfortunately, the minute your employer or the company doesn't like you, you're out the door. So that's also obviously important to note. But having the skill and actually being very effective and efficient in your process and then being hired and having that role doesn't really then affect who likes you and who doesn't. So just always thinking of it from that perspective and not just prioritizing, okay, this is just another job where I'm like that. Um, and then it's not always just um, what you know, it's also who you know. If you have connections and they're rooted really um, in meaningful connections, it's easier to navigate your career path and obviously climb the ladder. I myself, I mean, I, I have the typical journey of, I mean, I started off early on in the AI technology sector. I did a ton of work around artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithm, just helping small and large scale um, companies to make smarter data-driven decisions. But um, fast forward, when I moved to this country in the US, I picked my first internship um, in city government. And from there, it was just really me making myself so useful to each department, making myself useful to the, to the mayor at the time and making connections and using some of my data backgrounds, my urban planning background. And obviously, I, I mean, I speak five languages. So a lot of those factors really complemented me. So even though I was considered an other based on how I look in terms of my accent, my background, et cetera, those were really the driving forces that really allowed me to be at the table. Um, but going back to maybe some of the, if I can get your question correctly, of course, just offering a pathway forward for everyone is so, so important. And I think everyone on this panel, in some shape or form, we are part of that solution. And there are going to be, obviously, if you are an upcoming entrepreneur, there's probably several questions that you have in mind um, and you don't know the answer to them, right? 
in terms of what, what it, how to develop your business development, some of the financial planning that comes in, the certification process, et cetera. So I would always recommend with, you know, start with, st start with the professors. You know, if, if, you, if you're connected with Dan, reach out to Dan. You're obviously in a great institution. So for some of the audience that are here, part of Damon, I think you're in a great facility to really um, develop and explore your entrepreneurial spirits. And if you're like me, I've always been a social impact entrepreneur. So I never really launched my own company. I was always too focused on identifying the problems, which means the more you become a social impact entrepreneur, you're looking at more problems which then adds to more problems. So then you're really <laughs> in the cycle of building solutions. So I'm in the for-profit world of things. But you know, whether it be the LLC arm, if, you're in the, if you want to launch your own company or you're the social impact entrepreneur, there's definitely that, that component. There's a synergy there. Um, go for it and continue to build a pathway forward. Fantastic, thank you. And um, I'm gonna open now, create a little bit of a broader question for our, our final couple of questions here so that anyone can sort of chime in and I, I won't necessarily direct it to any one individual panelist. Um, so each uh, of our panelists have um, been able to create an entrepreneurial endeavor in, in some way, whether it's in the arts and culturals or the, or the social sector. Um, and we know that when, when the entrepreneur begins, in large part, they are an organization of one when they're starting before they can gain, gain traction, especially if they don't have these networks or infrastructure that was um, brought up early on in the conversation by uh, Jawari and, and Jean Marie. So as these individual kind of businesses of one, we all deal with challenges early on um, and then, and of course, then successes. So could anyone want to speak to either one of the things that they found to be most important in their journey as an entrepreneur, something they're most proud of, biggest challenge, just so that we can kind of open up the conversation to a little sort of personal insight here. I would love to jump in there. Um, to Jawari's point also, yeah, yeah, skill has to come first, right? Um, that That's massive. But um, in terms of what it's like to be an entrepreneur in this space and be um, alone at the beginning, for me, I come from an each one teach one kind of ethos. So somebody taught me, so I'm going to teach someone else. So in order for my company to build, I might be able to hire one skilled person and two people who have a lot of potential, who might be getting looked over for a variety of reasons. But if they come to me and they say, hey, you know, I want in for whatever reason that is that I also feel passionate about, then, you know, I'm going to say yes. And a lot of times that's just making myself, which is terrifying for me as a person, but making myself visual, uh, visible and vocal about the things that I care about and about the things that I want to teach. And I'd love to just give a quick example, which is um, when COVID first started, um, you know, my industry shut down and we didn't know if we were ever going to come back. And the thought of like people having to put hands in puppets when at the time we were told it was taught, taught you touch something and you would be exposed was like, what? so I started like a, a group of uh, a task force to get together to talk about what would be our self health and safety protocols. So that when Apple and HBO and all these companies asked, we were ready. But on a personal level, that wasn't enough for me. And so I started taking these daily meditations that I do personally and putting them online. And maybe they'd get one like, two likes, three likes, you know, that was a big day. Um, but my DMs were blowing up from people all over the place. And I just decided that what I was doing in my company was less important than this need that I was feeling from the people around me. And so I served them. I kept writing these. I still write them every single day. I put out a book last week. I launched a book. Like, what am I doing right now? But it was like, okay, where does this go? How can I keep pulling these people along? Where are they propelling me and following that spirit? And along the way, picking up more people um, who came from different backgrounds, who I found fascinating um, and giving them a platform. So, I, you know, to answer your question, I feel like there's, there's an infinite number of examples of how we can uh, be social entrepreneurs and a whole lot of them haven't been discovered yet. You know, and I'm excited about that. You know, like that's why I just did this book idea you know because i've never touched that so like okay let's just dip our toe in right if it doesn't work i'll back out that's fine but continuously wanting to explore and continuously wanting to bring each other along and continuously wanting to help your community 
I think yeah. is essential. Well, I think the, you know, the, the, the outcome book is sort of interchangeable with it could be it could be any right. end point because you've been able to sort of train yourself in kind of a method of entrepreneurship. You know how to approach the, you know, approach the problem in a sort of systematic way and and scale that into a business, whether it's the form of a book or, or what have you. And I think that's a very important takeaway. I believe so. Did someone want to chime in on that? I think it might I, be. I, I want to know the book. How do we get the book? Thank you for asking. You can go on iBooks or barnesandnobles.com. It's called 52 Simple Ways to, uh, simple, oh my God, I forgot the name of my own book. 52 Simple Weekly Meditations to Guide You Through Life's Transitions. Guess what it's about, because it's in the title. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Of course, no, I'm gonna get that immediately. I, I would just love to add to, and, and Dan responding to to the question that you had asked, um, you know the, the, the Adam and I he's my co-host on on the show and we've, we've created it together. We we always joke, you know, that the stakes are are typically pretty low. You know, we're talking about doll wiggling on on fake radio, right? Um, but we we have had the lovely opportunity to, you know, build a network of people who we. We didn't know as as the show has has grown and last year when we um you know when the whole world was shutting down and lots of people in in our industry were were struggling to um you know pay their bills and and health insurance and and all those sorts of things um we had it, a moment that i'm most proud of with with our program is that we teamed up with the puppeteers of america and were able to um begin a fundraiser which was a series of um of episodes where we had you know, truly some of the biggest names um, in puppetry, people who, you know, perform Kermit and Big Bird um, or, or Miss Piggy and, uh, you know, New York Times photographers and, and just a wonderful group of, of people. Um, and all of the, the proceeds, you know, we were hawking t-shirts and mugs and, and directing people to the website and, and, and folks could get early access to those episodes, um, all to help support, um, ensuring that puppeteers were able to, um, you know, pay their medical bills or, or pay their rent or pay for their groceries. Um, and that was, um, something that we were really proud of that, um, we were able to do. And it, it was only able to happen because of, of the network and, and the, the group of people and the community that we had built along the way. Thank you, Cam. Um, and now just another sort of broad question and I'll, um, whoever wants to jump in first and we'll go around and hear each person's um, point of view. Again, just um, sort of bringing it back to the, the notion of either social entrepreneurship or, or creative entrepreneurship. Um, you know, we see that, you know, so much of the kind of the, the, the current trends um, are being, again, dictated on, on the local level. This is oftentimes where we see the grassroot, grassroots movements being generated. And then slowly they tend to kind of move their way up and possibly have some type of impact on, on the larger kind of corporate or business structure in, in the US. So what I'm interested in, in hearing from both of, uh, of this great panelist's perspective is how, how can we, how do we see either the arts and cultural sector on, on a, in, in, a, in a smaller, uh, sort of smaller scenario, or the social entrepreneurial sector impacting the larger conversation, whether that be the corporate conversation or in Jawari's point of view, um, public policy, how can we see the sort of the flip of, of the conversation? Or, or is my question not, um, not uh, articulate? Should I, should I reframe that a little bit? I'll, I'll jump into that question. Mm -hmm. um, I think they all go hand in hand. You know, I live in Brooklyn um, and where I live is a neighborhood that has gone through a lot of changes historically over time since every building was put up, right? And so the people who live in this community now don't want to see it change, even though there is a lot of affluence uh, growing here. But I watched a, a business that was one of my friends' uh, restaurants. It has been in business for 17 years. People came from all over the world to go to it. And we watched it close. And the landlord said he was going to bring in Starbucks. And a coffee shop had opened across the street. 
And ever since then, that coffee shop has had a line around the block all day long, every day. If that Starbucks ever opened, it will be empty. Anybody who goes there will be a tourist because this neighborhood as a whole has agreed that small businesses come first, right? And a lot of the neighborhood are artists. So part of the way that that message got out was musicians going down the block and artists handing out posters and flyers. Like everybody came together to address this issue. And you know, when, when Black Lives Matters was at the heat of the conversation last summer and will be again soon and ought to be, things were being blown up in my neighborhood, literally. Cars were being flipped, things were being set on fire and the artists came out the next morning with brooms and cleaned up the neighborhood because we don't do that here. So I do think that all of these things can and need to work together. And it makes me think of Harry Belafonte saying, when the music is good, the movement is good. And the music comes from the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is how we're seeing, again, the local level of social entrepreneurship really facilitating civic engagement. Um, and Jawari, I know this is sort of a field that you're uh, very involved in. So would you like to pick this up, please? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's so very much connected. I mean, if you look at a lot of, you know, a lot of small businesses, the idea of profitability and also social responsibility just go hand in hand. Um, and that's what we're discussing today. Social entrepreneurs are solving public problems. They're identifying a problem and then figuring out means to really bring about the positive change, whether it's just a, a blighted vacant lot that they live next to, how to, I don't know, activate that vacant lot so that it doesn't, be, so it becomes an asset and doesn't become an, an area for people to just maybe dump or things of that nature. Those are all social entrepreneurs. But then the same on the other front, when it comes to starting a business, you're in the business of creating jobs. Um, and some of the businesses that we invest in, for instance, if it's somebody who is um, coming from a dismarginalized community, for example, or really a distressed neighborhood, when they launch a business, chances are they're going to launch a business in their own backyard. So that means now they're going to hire someone that looks like them. And they're in the business of creating. So someone else who might have been in poverty is now elevated to the point where they can see someone that looks like them starting a business, launching a business, and being their own boss. So I think, again, the conversation is they go hand in hand. And unfortunately, for some reason, we tend to look at entrepreneurship as this one arm. And we don't look at folks that are that have the civic-minded um, social entrepreneur model as you know, we don't give them their same technical opportunities, et cetera. If you're running a nonprofit, you still have to run like a business. Um, so you really, they're, they're really just, there is no difference, at least from my perspective. And then uh, Chad, can you maybe t take it a little further in terms of how you see either the, maybe arts and culturals kind of either reflecting the, the vibe of a locale or having an impact on, on, on the community itself? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Touching on kind of a sentiment that I, I said earlier about like a small box theater being able to have more of an impact than a, a sitcom. Um, I think that personally, like the art that comes from local communities, whether it be plays or films or whatever it is, uh, tend to be a, an, an unbelievable mirror into what that community's point of view is towards the world and, and their but also because it's so local and it's not usually not profit driven as much, it's more honest and um, you get to see a reflection of who this community wants to be. Um, so for on my end, when I, I travel around and and see all these other artists from smaller communities with not uh, with a desire where their first desire isn't profit and or visibility, it's it's just to tell a really good story or show some art, whatever it may be. Um, I, I think that also dictates like incredible artists that feel free and learn how to use their voice um, and create like a money-making and profit profitable plays in, in playhouses and theaters all around this community. But I think it becomes a breeding ground for individuals that learn how to use their voice and uh, learn how that their art and their and their stories can dictate the kindness or the responsibility of a certain community. And I think once they do that, it becomes a, a launching pad for the people that we all know, like names that we all understand, because they've learned in smaller communities how to use their voice before actually going to a, a dominant society or industry like Hollywood or New York. Mm 
And also, if, and this kind of helps us, I think, go full circle with uh, what Chad's bringing up in terms of the you know the small box theater. And I can see it almost as a as a as a metaphor as well as an actual space because it pro it does provide a platform for um, individuals um, on the on the local level to participate in uh, inclusive conversation. Um, it becomes relevant to to them, to their lives, to their background. And if we can see kind of a standard sort of corporate business like the Starbucks that uh, Jean Marie um, referenced, um, it's it, it's it has a, a real need, but it certainly is a homogenized, um, you know, uh, has a homogenized function where this coffee shop or this black box theater or the social justice organization on the local level is going to have the flexibility uh, to be responsive to the needs and the kind of the, the vibe of, of that local level. I go back to this kind of idea that the, the ancient Greeks brought up, which is, you know, amateur as being a positive. It's, it's what creates vitality. Uh, you know, we aspire to kind of a professional life, but um, we still have to have a kind of a moment where many different voices are kind of brought in and that's, it creates this notion of vitality. So I'm just going to um, kind of end with this question for the panelists and anyone can, again, chime in. Um, could you speak a little bit again about how we think social entrepreneurism can create uh, a vital or a vital community or give vitality to a community? I, I can I can tell you that from the, the answer that I just said previously, I think is is kind of like just building off of that. I think creating a community in which you feel free to be yourself and chase whatever you want, uh, passion, and then feel support from the community for that and responsibility to take care of it and show that to others. I think that like uh, a neighborhood that has made a decision to support small businesses over chains. And so don't even try to come here because we're going to, we're going to just build up the people in our community. I think the, the freedom, whether it comes through art or small business ownership, is it goes hand in hand of just creating a, an environment um, where you reward people for serving your community in in whatever way you deem necessary. Um, and just to add to it, I think we kind of briefly touched on this already, but small businesses just create jobs that don't get outsourced, they don't get automated. We know that it adds a healthy tax base, which we need. Again, all of these factors add a vitality. And then it also just builds the community's confidence. Um, the more small businesses, the mom and pop businesses that you see, it gives you the sense of ownership. And so before COVID, and I'm not quite sure what the current stats are, but before you know, COVID, small businesses were driving about 44% of the US economy. Um, I wonder what that metric is now. Um, but yeah, I think Chad pretty much summarized that question. We and I, a, uh, yeah, please jump in. I, I was going to say, I, I, and I think Jean Marie mentioned something earlier, um, the idea that, uh, that high waters raises all ships. And I think, you know, th there's been echoes of that throughout this conversation of the ways that the more we can support other people, um, we not only bolster them, but we bolster ourselves and we, we bolster the other people who are trying to accomplish similar things. It's creating those opportunities um, that allow everybody um, who are trying to do similar things to to thrive and prosper and, and find a space for themselves to do that work. And, uh, uh, General, you, you want to add to that, please? Yeah, I would love to. I, I also think that it, it drives the amount of diversity that we have around us and that the understanding, right? If everybody has a job, if everyone has a space, if we're all showing up for each other, um, kindness and tolerance can have a chance at coming out on top. So, you know, that's the social aspect, right? We, we need to, to hear each other. And you hear each other more when you go to a small grocery store and you meet the person who's from a different culture than you and have a conversation with them. You know, every place you go, if, if you listen and you keep your eyes open, I think that having small businesses, creating opportunities for entrepreneurs, um, creates opportunities for more voices to go into this pot. You know, we're supposed to be living in a melting pot. So like, let's all get in. Um, the idea of that is exciting to me. The reality of that uh, is something that we need to fight for. In my opinion. And I would just push, if I can just comment that, I would just push and say, don't let tolerance just be the foundation. I mean, yes. tolerance is one thing, but strive for even more than that. No one, 
as a company says, okay, we're just going to tolerate this. That's not really accepting or strong enough. So really push for understanding that somebody that looks different to you or when you see that something is different to what you're comfortable with or your norm, it's not necessarily them that's the issue. And I can't remember this quote exactly, but there was a recent book that I read and they gave an example of an, escal an escalator's responsibilities to remo move you from location A to B, it's either up or down. And then if you picture somebody with a wheelchair next to that escalator, you know, we see that as, you know, oh my goodness, it's the person with the wheelchair that becomes the issue. It's not, we should look at the system as the issue. So if the, as the person on the wheelchair is not able to move from A to B, it's not necessarily the person's fault, but we have to create systems that can still allow that person who's not fitting that norm to still be able to move from A to B. Um, just a quick comment on that. Yeah, yeah thank you for saying that. I'm oh, sorry. Can, oh, I'm sorry. Make, can I make one more comment on that? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for saying that because yes, I don't like that word and I don't know why. I'm like learning a new language um, to get past that. But you know, in the in the that exact example of the wheelchair, right? I won't do a show in, in a place if it's not um, accessible. Like that, everybody knows that. That's just understood. And if you're going to do a show at the top of the mountain, everybody needs to get there, and I mean everybody. Um, and I'm unapologetic about that. But I, I do think that that comes from asking questions and listening, right? And I'm not perfect, none of us are perfect. But if part of becoming a social entrepreneur starts with listening, we, we have a better chance of growing as, as a society. And uh, I'll just use that as our kind of final um, comment on this really dynamic conversation that everyone brought to uh, to the table here. And, it, you know, it just seems in that closing remark, uh, Jim Marie, this uh, and this kind of I think echoes a lot of people's comments about the social entrepreneur um, is malleable and, and and responsive. And here we are. Um, you know, about 20, 20, 20 percent into this century. And it seems like that is that those are going to be the real driving factors of, of organizations as we continually live in these uncertain times where things are happen happening at such a rapid pace, um, having a, a much more responsive, flexible organization on the local level um, seems to be really a, the way to go if I'm, if I'm hearing a lot of the kind of the responses from, from the group here. So I want to just close by thanking our, our audience today and our wonderful uh, panelists and really everyone that made today's conversation possible, um, as well as our sponsor today, the graduate program at Damon College. So these conversations will be ongoing throughout the year. So please um, keep us in mind uh, by following us and checking out uh, what's happening here at the college and so that we can continue uh, keeping you informed and bringing you really wonderful thought leaders in their um, sector, certainly that is clearly illustrated today. So uh, all of our panelists, thank you so much for a really wonderful conversation. Uh, until we see each other again, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Leadership has the power to transform individuals, teams, organizations, and the world. That's why it's critical to receive an education that provides a solid foundation. The Leadership and Innovation Graduate Program at Damon College works to empower students, foster their creativity, and promote collaboration. Students gain the skills that enable them to lead rapid change.